Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lesson, you are looking at the doctrine and the stories and the teachings of the Savior that are found in Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapter 8 and chapter 13. And for a few minutes now, I'm going to spend some time focusing on two of the several parables that the Savior gives in this week's reading assignment. Particularly, it's the, uh, or specifically, actually, is the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and the tares. And behind me is a picture of a field full of wheat. And I'm really excited about the things that I'm going to share with you with the wheat and the tares and how it's really some prophecy that the Savior was giving, not only as recorded in Matthew, but he reiterates that prophecy again in the Doctrine and Covenants. And now today, we're seeing those prophecies from the Savior himself coming to pass. And I'm going to read some things from President Nelson where he doesn't specifically talk about wheat and tares or Matthew chapter 13, but you can see that what he is saying when, when we're thinking of what's going on in Matthew chapter 13 with the wheat and the tares parable, that he really is talking about the fulfillment of these of these prophecies of the Savior. So I'm going to do the parable of the sower first because that comes first in Matthew chapter 13 and then the parable of the wheat and the tares. So if you're not going to watch the whole video, it's not that the wheat and tares is better than the than the parable of the sowers, but I would say if you're going to do one or the other, go to the end of the video and uh, listen to what I'm about to say about the wheat and tares. So for those of you that are still with me, wanting to watch the whole video, let's talk about the parable of the sower. Now, this is interesting. The Savior's talking about these seeds and whatnot. And as you read it and as you study from the Come, Follow Me manual, you'll start to see that, that this is a real description of not only people generally, but specifically members of the church and how they respond to teachings, practices, doctrine of the church. And we get a couple of examples here, and I want to pull out... Uh, two scenarios that are going on in this parable and then i want to go to the book of mormon for an explanation so we find in chapter 13 of matthew verse 19 the sower's gone out and he's talking about uh here the savior is talking about uh it, when when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart this is he which receives seed by the wayside. So he's using seeds as descriptions of people. And he says, hey, the seed that goes by the wayside, it's not able to get into the good fertile soil and put down the roots. They're going to suffer. That seed is going to suffer. It's not going to be able to grow and mature. And so it is with some, specifically members of the church, who understand not or, or when they hear the word and they don't understand it then they don't get their roots embedded or deeply driven into the good soil and so they they get lost or they 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 struggle with their testimony now hold on to that for a second because that seems like it's pretty pretty unchrist like to say hey if you don't understand you're done and Hold on, let's continue through and let's figure out why that particular seed in the description, in the descriptive way that the Savior is using it is, has an opportunity to turn out okay, but it's that opportunity that we must, must look for. So as we get down to verse 23, contrast it. So he who receiveth and doesn't understand, they're cast out. They're, they're having a heart, they're not cast out. What's the actual phrase that the, the wicked one comes and catcheth them away. But then in, in 23, but he that receiveth the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. So opposites. First, I've received the word, but I don't understand it. I'm done for. Second, I received the word. I understand it. I'm in good, good soil. I'm going to be just fine. Now, is this an intellectual competition? Whoever can understand the doctrine, become a scriptural mastery, somehow gets a free pass into the celestial kingdom? Of course not. So then what does this scripture mean? Let's go to Nephi for the explanation. 
In 1 Nephi chapter 15, Lehi's had his vision and he's told it to his family. And Laman and, Le and, then, and then Nephi goes and he says, I want to see what my dad saw, but I don't want to just see it. I want to know the explanation. I want to understand. And so the angel teaches him. And then he comes out of that vision. Can, that vision concludes and Nephi comes out and he finds his brothers, Laman and Lemuel, talking about Lehi's vision. And they're thinking, we don't understand what's going on here. Okay, understand? So in verse 19, there, that's Laman and Lemuel. We don't understand what's going on. Verse 23, I understand. We all heard the same thing, but one group is not understanding. One group is understanding. Nephi understands. Uh, so what's the difference between Laman and Lemuel and Nephi? What's the difference between the people described in Matthew 13, 19 and verse 23? Nephi tells us exactly what it is in verse 8. He asks his brothers, who don't, don't understand, he says, And I said unto them, Have ye inquired of the Lord? And they said back to him, <coughs> We have not. For the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. And Nephi says, Why not? Why wouldn't he? In verse 11, Do you not remember the things which the Lord hath said? If ye will not harden your hearts and ask me in faith, believing that ye shall receive with diligence in keeping my commandments, surely these things shall be made known unto you. So we go back to Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, and we say, hey, the poor guy, he doesn't understand, and so the wicked one comes and carries him away. The wicked one doesn't come and carry him away because the man or the person doesn't understand. It's because that person makes no effort to understand. He doesn't go and inquire of the Lord, as Nephi says. Now, in verse 23 in Matthew, the seed, the, the, the person receives the word, and hears the word and understands it. Why? Because they inquired of the Lord. Now, if it's not, if Nephi's words aren't enough, let's hear it from the Savior himself, still in the Book of Mormon. This is 2 Nephi chapter 32. And the Savior is speaking and teaching Nephi a lot of things. But on the topic that we're on here, he specifically says this in 2 Nephi chapter 32, verse 4. Wherefore, this is the Savior speaking, not Nephi. Wherefore, now after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. So why in verse 19 of Matthew 3 did the, the, the individual understand and then perish? The Savior says, because you didn't ask, you didn't knock. And so you must perish in the dark because I can't give you the light unless you ask for it. Nephi understood this. Nephi asked. He then understood. The layman and Lemuel, they didn't bother. So what happened? They were like what's described in Matthew 13, 19. Neil A. Maxwell gave this interesting quote on this topic. Not in relation, I don't think, to to this parable or anything, but in one of his conference addresses, he said, to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it is clear that the Father and Son are giving away the secrets of the universe. What are the secrets of the universe? What's the definition of secret? Something unknown. So what's unknown? The very thing that you are praying for right now. Because if you knew the answer, you wouldn't be praying for it. But the very thing that you're praying for right now is a secret to you. You don't know how it's going to turn out. And the Father and Son, Neil and Maxwell says, are giving away the answers to those questions. If, Elder Maxwell says, if we will hear and listen. Like, hear him. Like President Nelson keeps saying. See how we got Old Testament New Testament, we got, no, we don't. Let's start over. We've got New Testament, Book of Mormon, 
the Savior, and Neil A. Maxwell teaching the very same exact thing. It's not just teaching the same thing, but it's providing the answer, the solution to the problem that we have. What do we do when we don't understand something? What do we do when we have a question? All those sources are giving us the same answer. Pray and ask about it. Now, when we pray and ask about it, it doesn't mean that the Lord's going to just instantly write it out for us, provide a revelation that gives us the clear answer. Could he? Yes. Does he sometimes? Of course he does. But sometimes not always. It's been my experience that when the Lord wants to answer a question, the answer comes in one of two ways. One, here's your answer. Or two, it's not time to give you the answer. <laughs> and that one can be kind of frustrating. But when we don't get the answer, because it's not the time, the Lord says not yet, or I'm not going to give you the full answer yet, we've got to rely on our faith. Elder or President Oaks said, if we knew everything, we wouldn't need faith. Then he says, but faith is required. So there are some things we're just not going to know, not, not for now at least. And that's going to be okay, he says. All right, that is the parable of the sower, or at least the little commentary I want to give on the parable. Could more be said about it? Of course it could. Why does the Lord teach in parables? Because we'll never have a complete under, uh, we will never have a complete teaching of, the par of any of these parables because that's the point of the parable. It's like when you read the Book of Mormon, what do you do when you, when you conclude on page 531? You go back to page one and you start over again. Why? Because the Lord is going to teach you something differently depending on what's going on in your particular life that day when you're reading a particular verse. And so that's why we keep reading the Book of Mormon. That's why we go back to the temple, even though the ceremonies of the temple or ordinances of the temple are word for word the same. We keep going back because we learn more and more. The parables are the same way. You read this parable this week, and you're going to get something out of it that's personal and unique to you. And that's why I'm not going to teach it to you, because it's going to be for you. And then you come back and read this same parable next year or 10 years from now, and you're going to see it completely differently again. And that's what's so important about this Come Follow Me program. We've got, to, we've got to study and learn and seek on our own so that we get that own, our own personal revelation. So that's just a little side note as to why I'm not diving in and teaching everything about the parable of the sower, but just a little, little side commentary there. So let's do the same with the parable of the wheat and the tares. So here's what's going on in Matthew chapter 13. The Savior, I'm just going to summarize it, but it's very short. Of course, you're going to read it. It's only four or five verses, but here's the summary. A farmer goes out, the sower. The farmer goes out, he plants the wheat, and then it's the end of the day. So what does he do at night? He goes to sleep. So while he's sleeping, a bad guy comes into his field, and he starts to plant these tares. And these tares are going to be like, like weeds, and they're going to they're gonna get in the way of the wheat and kind of choke them out a little bit. So the bad guy comes in, plants the tares, and the workers the next day, they go to the farmer, and they say, hey, should we get out there and clean out the tares? And the farmer says, no, you can't. You can't. Because if you go out and clean, if you go clean out the tares, you're going to clean out some of the wheat as well. And I don't want to get rid of any of the wheat. Now, I'm no farmer. But what I understand is that when, a wheat, when wheat and a tare are, are young in their growing cycle, you can't, you can't tell them apart. And you can't tell them apart until they're fully grown and, and, and bloomed, if, that, if that's what they do. And then after some, after some time, when they're fully developed, then you can say, okay, that's a wheat, that's a tear. But when they're, when they're young, when they're sprouting, when they're growing and maturing, I understand it, that you can't tell them apart. And so that's why here in the parable, the Savior teaches that in the story that the man says to the workers, no, 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 we, we can't go in and separate them right now. Because we, if we get rid of the tares, we're going to get rid of some wheat. But in the parable, the farmer says, see, I should have just read it because the four or five verses is way shorter than my commentary and summary. This isn't a summary. But the way that it concludes is the farmer, the sower says, one day there will be a harvest and the wheat will be separated from the tares and the wheat will be saved. 
Of course, as, as all parables, this is all symbolic. So what, what, are, the, what, what's, what are the symbols that we're looking for? What, what is represented in this story? Joseph Smith had the same question. So you're in good, we are in good company. If you look at section 86 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord explains the parable of the wheat and tares. So I'm going to set aside the New Testament for a minute, and I'm going to focus exclusively on Doctrine and Covenants section 86, in which the Lord provides the meaning of the parable of the wheat and the tares. And this is pretty exciting stuff. Because like I said at the beginning of the video, as I dissect section 86, we're going to see that the prophecy of, the, of this parable is unfolding right before our eyes. And I'll prove it with a couple of quotes from President Nelson. So in section 86, verily, verily, thus say, or just one verily, verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servants, this is verse one, concerning the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now the Lord is going to explain it. We get to verse two, and it's all symbolic. And he says, the field that's in the parable, that represents the world. And the, um, the sowers, the workers, those are the apostles. So we've got the apostles, or we've got the workers out in the field, representing the apostles out in the world. Now, what are the apostles doing? They're planting what is good, what is righteous, what is godlike, what is leading us to the Savior, not only to him, but to become like him. All the things that the apostles are doing, they're planting the wheat or working amongst the wheat. And then we get down into verse three. Um, and, and you remember back in Matthew chapter 13, the, the sower, he goes out, puts the wheat, and then he goes home and goes to sleep. So the Savior picks up the symbolism there. In verse 3 of section 86, and after they have fallen asleep, so now the apostles, those are they're out there sowing the good seeds, the great persecutor of the church, the apostate, the whore, even Babylon, that maketh all nations to drink of her cup, in whose hearts the enemy, even Satan, sitteth to reign. Behold, he soweth the tares. Wherefore, the tares choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. There's a lot in verse 3 right there. So remember the summary I gave of the wheat and tares as described in Matthew chapter 13. They've got this field. They're planting the good stuff. Who's planting it? The apostles. Where in the world? What are they planting? Everything that leads to righteousness. The apostles, the apostles fall asleep? What? Do they just get lazy? Do they check out? Do they say, well, I've served my time and it's time for somebody else to work? No. Joseph Fielding Smith teaches that when the Lord says that, that, that they fall asleep, that means they die off. That means it's the end of the authority. That means the church fell into apostasy. So the church did. We're still talking about past. In a second, we're going to talk about present and future. So in the past, the Lord's describing in this parable, the apostles did a great job. Then they all died. Then the um, world fell, or the church fell into apostasy. The church didn't fall into apostasy. There was an apostasy because the church was no longer on the earth. And when the church and the apostles and the authority were gone, that's when Satan made his move and pushed the earth or the church, as it were, into the wilderness. And he took over, and he started to influence the world. He had free reign of it, really, because the church, or, or there was the apostasy, and the church wasn't on the earth. Is all hope lost? Of course not. The Savior then says, But behold, in the last days, even now, while the Lord is beginning to bring forth the word, and the blade is springing up and is yet tender. Pause and hold on. Because back in, 13, in verse 3, it says that Babylon is going to come in. What is Babylon? Is Babylon something physical, tangible? It certainly can be. Babylon, and I, I'm sorry for going back. I should have said this before reading verse 4. 
But Babylon is anything that distracts us from the Savior. Anything that deprives us of the Spirit. Anything that leads us in a direction that's not towards our Heavenly Father. Now, with such a broad definition, you can think of in your own life, what are the Babylons that you face every day and that I face every day? Maybe it's not a bad guy coming in and planting uh, tares, but it's the small and simple things that can quickly detract from the path that our Heavenly Father would have us be on. It's those things that the world provides that deprive us of the Spirit, that rob us of the Spirit, that disqualify us from the Spirit if we choose or let ourselves participate in those things. So when we say Babylon, that's just a big umbrella, descriptive word that encompasses anything and everything that doesn't lead us to Christ. So that's that's where we are. So now we can start relating this and we say, okay, yeah, there's Babylon all around us. Okay, then we get to verse four, but behold, in the last days, okay, so now we're coming towards present and future. He says the Savior in the last days, even now, now that's cool. He says, even in the last days, even, or in the last days, even now, well, look at your section heading. This was given in 1832. So in 1832, the Lord declared, this is the last days. We're in the final moments here. But in the last days, even now, while the Lord is beginning to bring forth the word, what's the word? It's 1832. It's been 12 years since the first vision. It's been four years, three years since the publication of the Book of Mormon. It's been two years since the official organization of the church. So it's about two to three years that we have had missionaries going out and sharing the message of the restored gospel. This is before the whole Kirtland era. Okay, we're, we're just getting into the Kirtland era. Joseph got to Kirtland in 1831, February, so it hasn't even been a year. And so no Kirtland Temple, no priesthood keys. We do have priesthood authority. No organization as far as bishops and stakes and that sort of thing. So we are just getting started. He's describing it. While the Lord is beginning to bring forth the word. Comma. I make emphasis of the comma because now it's almost another thought. And the blade is springing up and is yet tender. What is the blade that is springing up that's tender? Wheat. We've got more wheat coming along. We've got the church that's coming out of the will. We're undoing everything. It's coming back out of the wilderness into reality, into the forefront. The Lord's bringing forth his word. We're experiencing a restoration. And now the wheat is now starting to grow up again. We've now got it coming back. Okay, and then let's jump to, uh, before I go to verse 5. Let me, let me describe something here. As the wheat is tender and young, and it's trying to grow up in a Babylonian type of world, we have a little bit of a problem. We've got the world standard as dictated by Babylon, and we've got the Lord's standard. And these are going to be moving up and down. The Lord's standard, the world standard. From 1832 until really recently, the world standard, moral compass, was pretty close in line with the Lord's standard. Both sides would say, it's wrong to lie. It's wrong to cheat. It's right to stay away from immoral things. And we could make a long list, and we could say not very many years ago, the standards were pretty close. In fact, it may even be a really short time ago that they were close. But now we see the world, their moral standard is decreasing. More is accepted. Lie a little, cheat a little, as the scriptures prophesied the world would say, end up saying. And that, and that standard of the world is decreasing. And now what we're finding is a gap. 
between the Lord's standard and the world's standard. And as we continue going through this parable, keep this in mind, because as the world continues to go down and down and down, this gap becomes wider and wider and wider. But there's a trap or a potential trap. As this gap starts to establish itself, the, the, the desirable outcome is for members of the church to recognize the gap and say, I don't go here. I live at this level. I won't participate here. I'm going to keep that gap. That's the desired outcome. But the trap or the potential trap is that as the world standard of morality and what's right and wrong continues to degrade and go lower and lower, how will we individually manage that? Will we say, I'm comfortable with that gap, so I'll keep the gap, regardless of how low the world goes. If I keep the gap, I'm okay. Or, this is the standard that the Lord has established, and no matter how low the world goes, and no matter how wide the gap becomes, we must stay firm and solid according to the Lord's standard. And so there's the choice. As it becomes, as the gap is there, are we going to just maintain a gap? Or are we going to say, Babylon, you can go as low as you want, and I'm not touching you. I'm staying high. I'm staying dry. So as we keep, as we keep that in mind, because that's what's going on, this few years ago, a few short years ago, now it's like this, but it's moving. This one keeps going down. The choice is what's happening individually up here. So now let's go to verse 5. So this is what's going on in the world, the Lord describes in verse 4. And I gave that little analogy describing verse 4. But then we get to verse 5. The Lord continues talking, Behold, verily I say unto you, the angels are saying unto the Lord day and night, who are ready and waiting to be set forth, sent forth to reap down the fields. But the Lord said, uh, saith unto them, Pluck not up the tares while the blade is yet tender. For verily your faith is weak, lest you destroy the wheat also. So now we're back into the New Testament parable where the workers said, hey, let me go in and clean out the tares. And the sower said, no, you can't, not yet. And now the Lord is saying today, in the last days, even now in verse 4, the angels are begging the Lord, let us go and clear out the tares. And the Lord is saying, no, you can't do it yet. Unless you, de unless you destroy the wheat, because they're still young. And so the angels are being held back by the Lord. And so he says, not yet. But then he says, when? When he will let the angels loose to divide the wheat from the tares. So we're talking present and future. They're kind of going to bleed here together. Verse 7, therefore... So the Lord's going to tell us when the angels are coming. Therefore, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is fully ripe. So until we get the wheat strong and ready. Um, and then ye shall first gather out the wheat from among the tares. And after the gathering of the wheat, behold and lo, the tares are bound in bundles and the field remaineth to be burned. Now we got to go back to the New Testament because there is something significantly different between the parable in the New Testament and the way the Lord is describing it in the Doctrine and Covenants. Back in the New Testament, he says, I'm holding back the workers until the time, and when the time happens, when the gathering or when the... Um, uh, separating of the wheat and the tares comes about. We go to Matthew 13, verse 30, and the Lord says, 
Similarly, as he did in Dr. Covenant, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, now here we go, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. We got wheat and tares. In Matthew, he says, go get the tares, gather them up, and let's burn them. In Doctrine and Covenants section 86, a more perfect, pure translation, in verse 7, let me read it again. The Lord says, then ye shall first gather out the wheat from the tares. And then after the gathering of the wheat, the tares are bound in bundles. I'll overemphasize some things. Do you hear what's going on? The Lord, in Matthew, it says, go get the tares, let's get rid of them. And the Lord says, no, no, the translators got that a little wrong. The way this is actually going to work is before the separation of the wheat and the tares, I'm going to go gather the wheat. And then we will get rid of the tares. So before the gathering, or excuse me, before the separation, there will be a gathering of the wheat. Back in 1894, Wilford Woodruff made this statement. He said, God has held the angels of destruction for many years, lest they should reap down the wheat and the tares. But I want to tell you now that those angels have left the portals of heaven. In 1832, the Lord said, I'm holding the angels back. In 1834, Wilford Woodruff said, the angels aren't being held back anymore. They have come. They have left the portals of heaven and they stand over this people and this nation now and are hovering over the earth, waiting to pour out the judgments. And from this very day, they shall be poured out. Calamities and troubles are increasing in the earth. And there is a meaning to these things. And then Wilford Woodruff continues, Remember this and reflect upon these matters. If you do your duty and I do mine, we will have protection and shall pass through the, through the afflictions in peace and safety. Now that was from 1894, where he says, it's happening. So that was a hundred and... 29 years ago, Wilford Woodruff says this gathering and this separation is taking place right now. Think of the calamities since 1894. War, financial ruin, famine, drought, weird weather, COVID, hurricanes. But then think about more of the last few years, the calamities political divisions, social divisions. Are all of these examples that I've given increasing, staying the same, or decreasing? Now you turn on the news and the answer is simple. All of these calamities are increasing and they're increasing at a fast rate. So from uh, 1894, Wilford Woodruff says, he doesn't say it's going to happen. He says it is starting. It the angels have left the portals of heaven. It's on its way. And now here we are, witnesses, a hundred and whatever years later, of that prophecy actually coming, coming to pass. So first, we gather the wheat before the division. President Nelson, in 2018, so five years ago, these surely are the latter days, and the Lord is hastening his work to gather Israel. What came, um, that gathering is the most important, I, let me start over. I have a note in here that distracted me. So first, let me back up. First, we have the gathering of the wheat, and then we have the division or the separation from the wheat and the tares. Where the tares, it's not going to turn out well for them. And then President Nelson in 2018 so five years ago, said, these surely are the latter days, and the Lord is hastening his work to gather Israel. That gathering is the most important thing taking place on earth today. Nothing else compares in magnitude 
Nothing else compares in importance. Nothing else compares in majesty. And if you choose to, if you really want to, you can be a big part of it. You can be a part of something big, something grand, something majestic. When we speak of the gathering, we are simply saying this fundamental truth. Every one of our Heavenly Father's children on both sides of the veil deserve to, to hear the message of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. They decide for themselves if they want to know more. Anytime you do anything to help anyone on either side of the veil take steps towards making covenants with God and receive their essential baptismal and temple ordinances, you are helping to gather Israel. It is as simple as that. So, this is where an opinion has to come in. But the question is, and the answer is only the opinion, is President Nelson warning us that the Savior's prophecy is coming to pass? And mind you, the words of President Nelson that I just read came from five years ago. What has happened in those five years as far as the gathering of Israel? How many missionaries have gone throughout the world? How many missionaries are going to new places? Now, to somewhat keep the privacy of my own family, I won't give you the details, but my daughter has received a mission call this last week. And her mission president, it's a very unique place, and um, her mission president wrote a, a letter congratulating her on accepting the call but he made the statement that she is one of the very first to go to this particular place. Uh, yes, I'm keeping, and there goes a the phone, but I, yeah, I'm keeping that, you know, family privacy, whatever. Um, but is it, is it happening? It is happening. And it's happening at a really great fast pace as well. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 86, verse nine, <clears throat> for he then is talking to the readers of the Doctrine and Covenants, for, or the members of the church specifically. For ye are lawful heirs. So he's talking about all this gathering. Then we throw in President Nelson's uh, quote about the gathering is happening and it's happening right now and nothing is bigger and better than, than this gathering. And then, at, so after all that, with all that in mind, um, uh, the Savior describes who will be doing this gathering. For ye are the lawful heirs. Remember, he's talking to the members of the church. Lawful heirs. What does that mean? Lawful, lawful heirs of what? Well, as members of the house of Israel, we are heirs to the blessings of, of, uh, that our Heavenly Father would give to us. But we can't just be baptized and get all the blessings. We have to be righteous. We have to be doing our best. We have to be moving toward him by moving down the covenant path. And by doing so, we are then lawful heirs. So the righteous members of the church, according to the flesh, and have been hid from the world. Now, why are the righteous members of the church being hid from the world? Let me give a, perhaps a definition of what that might mean. President Nelson said this, Our Heavenly Father has reserved many of His most noble spirits, perhaps I might say, His finest team for this final phase. Those noble spirits, those finest players, those heroes are you, President Nelson says. He has reserved the members of the church Today's members of the church, he has reserved for this moment, for this gathering, just before the separation of the wheat and the tares. And so could that be what the Savior means, that you've been hid from the world because you haven't even been in the world? Because you were in the pre-existence waiting for your opportunity to come because he needed to reserve you for this very exact moment? That's how I would define it. That's how I teach it. So that, my friends and brothers and sisters, is uh, Matthew 13, Luke 8, and Luke 13. And uh, the things that I've said today I know to be true because they are the words of the Savior. And I say these things in His name, even Jesus Christ.